You know, maybe you're a person that is new to personal security and you're wondering if maybe a defensive firearm is the right tool for you. It's also possible you've been around for, uh, with firearms for a long time and you're that person that family and friends go to and ask the question, is a gun the right tool for me? You know, maybe there's somebody out there that you care about that you think should have a gun, but you haven't quite been able to convince them that a firearm for personal protection is the right decision to make. If you're any of those situations, or maybe some other situation I haven't mentioned, you're in the right place. Today, we're going to take a look at why it is we might want to have a defensive firearm. Welcome to the Safety Solutions Academy. I got to tell you, this is a, kind of an exciting time. We're opening our first live hangout. This is the place where everyday people are going to be able to come to learn to live a safer life through understanding personal security, uh, unraveling the, the mysteries that surround defensive training, and demystifying the gun. Again, my name is Paul Carlson. I want to welcome you to Safety Solutions Academy. In just a minute, we're going to go ahead and get started and talk about that important question. That question is, why would you want to have a defensive handgun? But I want to point out a couple of things to you about our Google Hangout today. First of all, this is an interactive session. If you're here with us live right now, you can ask your questions and answers. In the lower right-hand side of your little Google Plus page, there's a spot where you can click on questions. You'll be able to see those on the right-hand side of your page when they come up. If you see a question you want answered, make sure you give it a plus one. If your question isn't there, make sure that you answer it. If you're watching this uh, at a later date, you should see those questions pop up as you look at the annotations in YouTube or on the Google Hangout event. So that's number one. Um, also, I want you to understand that uh, this show is going to be better with that interaction. The best way we can get interaction is to share this event with other folks. Right now, if you highlight the URL up at the top of your uh, browser, put that up on your Facebook page. Send it to a friend that you think might be interested. Do a text message or tweet it out to folks. But let folks know that Safety Solutions Academy is going on right now live. They can still join us and take a look at what's going on. And as I look, you know, we've got multiple viewers that have already checked in. I'm glad to see that, and I'm excited to have a great hangout with you folks tonight. So make sure you post your questions, and make sure you share this with other folks. Now, understand, we've got uh, somebody with us here today to help out, Grant Cunningham. He's a professional defensive shooting instructor. He's the owner of the Personal Security Institute, author of multiple defensive firearms-related books, and he's an expert when it comes to self-defense and personal security. Grant, how are you doing today? I'm tonight. terrific, Paul. Yeah, that's true. It is, uh, it is getting to be evening just about everywhere. That's right. Uh, Grant is out in the Pacific Northwest. Of course, I'm in Eastern Time, so uh, we're, we're jumping the time zones to bring uh, you folks a great show. So, Grant, you know, I want to talk uh, today about this, this concept of why have a personal defensive handgun. But I want to do it in a way that kind of fits with my style. I don't want to get right to the point. I want to kind of go around and, and connect some dots. So as you're a professional defensive firearms instructor, as I am, you know, I own Safety Students Academy, you own the Personal Security Institute. Uh, we're both professional defensive firearms instructors, and we interact with a lot of students. And some of those students are just making their way into firearms, and they are wondering to themselves, why is it they should have a firearm? And what I find is a lot of people have some misconceptions about firearms and what role that firearm is going to be able to play when they actually get it. Have you had that experience? Sure, I've had that experience quite a bit. A lot of people have, I think, sometimes a misguided idea of what the handgun is for. Uh, or, quite frankly, it goes even beyond handguns. It goes on to long guns as well. Exactly what the, what the purpose of that gun is and what its role is in the greater role of personal safety. And, you know, that's what people's goal is, is personal safety. I don't think anybody goes out there with the idea that, oh, I, I want to buy a gun and, oh, I'll find a use for it. I think most people are going out there and say, gee, I want to be safer, I want to feel safer, and I think the gun might be a way to do it. And that's where we usually start that discussion. You know, Grant, you bring up a really important point when you say they want to feel safer. And that's one of the things that worries me about people um, procuring firearms, whether it's a handgun, a shotgun, a rifle, for home defense, for concealed carry, is they want to feel safer. And the, the gun itself, 
does, should that actually make someone feel safer? Is that the answer to the question? I, I don't feel safe. I, I'll get a gun. Then I'll feel safe. What I do think, you think about that? I think, unfortunately, that happens quite a bit. I think there are a lot of people, and there are even some of those people in the defensive shooting instructional world. I agree. Who, yeah, and, and you know where I'm going with this because there is that idea that the gun is a talisman, that it's somehow going to keep them safe. And the way I've explained it many, many times, in fact, this morning on my blog, I, I put it this way, that the the handgun, the firearm in general, actually, but the handgun specifically, is a tool for a very, very narrow range of application. The incidents in which the handgun is valuable and when it's both legal and ethical to use compri comprise a very, very small number of, of incidents in the world. The consequence of that small number is very, very high, but the likelihood of encountering one of those is relatively low. So we have to balance that, that concept of incidence, which is the number of times it might be used, versus consequences, and it's kind of a risk management way of looking at things. People have to understand that this is a very valuable tool inside of where it's used. It's, in, it's incredibly invaluable, as a matter of fact, particularly when we're talking about uh, a larger or more aggressive assailant. But they also have to understand that there's a whole lot of other things that when we talk about personal safety and when we talk about self-defense, there are a whole lot of other things that they need to understand too. The, the handgun is not going to be useful for that time when the panhandler is annoying them. It's not the right thing to do when they're in the bar and the guy's hitting on their girl. Uh, it's And as we saw recently in a court case, it's not the thing to pull out when somebody's playing on a cell phone in the movie theater. Uh, so we have to have that discussion with people and with the students and get them to understand that. So it sounds like you're alluding to some misunderstandings that students have. We already hit on one big one is that the gun itself doesn't actually make you safer. And now you're talking about the idea that there's just a very narrow set of circumstances where the firearm can really be beneficial. And, and I think that's important, too. What other misunderstandings do you see students having about the gun, uh, about that firearm being that, that end-all, be-all solution to their defensive problem? Well, I think that, uh, uh, and I see, that, unfortunately, I don't see this as much as I used to, but I know you and I have both seen this, is the person that says, well, I want a gun, but I don't really want to shoot anybody, I just want to use it to scare someone. Um, the, the handgun is a lethal tool, and uh, the, the, the idea that we'll use it uh, just to scare someone off or, or to put the fear of God into someone, as, as someone once said, is one of the misconceptions that I see quite a bit. And I have to really talk about that and explain to them, listen, that's not what the gun is for. The gun, if you are not, if you are not ready to shoot someone, not that we, we look forward to shooting anybody or that we really want to shoot anybody, but if you're not prepared for the idea that that gun exists to present lethal force to stop someone from attacking you, if you're not comfortable with that idea of having to shoot someone, then maybe that's something you shouldn't have. That's a, the, the misconception that I run across quite a bit, that, oh, I just wanted to use it to scare someone. You know, Grant, that's a, that's a really important point, and it's actually something I've started to run into more and more. I'm working with the, uh, I guess I'll call them a sporting goods chain store, and they're selling some of my classes over the counter, and from time to time when I'm working there at the store, I bump into folks that actually say that. You know, I don't think I, I could really ever shoot anybody, but they still think that the firearm is the right solution for them. And as you pointed out, that just doesn't make any sense. It is a tool for a very narrow niche when you need to defend yourself or defend those that you love. And you're going to have to do that by being willing and ready to pull the trigger. Um, someone that's not ready to do that probably shouldn't choose a firearm. Do you, do you run into any other folks that you wouldn't? Well, let me, let me ask this question. What do you do when you get those folks that's, that have that feeling of, well, I'm not really sure that I could shoot anybody? How, how do you handle that? I, I have that conversation with them, and one of the things that I do is by taking away the idea that I want to buy a handgun or I want to buy a gun in general. Let's take that out and not use that term. Let's say I want to be able to employ lethal force. As soon as we do that, the, the conversation usually changes, and that usually gets people to thinking in, in, in the right terms. If we talk about, okay, I need to something to you, I need to be able to use lethal force to stop someone from hurting me. 
all of a sudden that becomes a much different discussion than I want a gun. And that's usually how I sort of turn that around and get people to thinking about it in those terms. Those people that aren't necessarily ready to use lethal force, have you found any ways to help them to understand why it is that it might be important for them to take that step and be ready to do that? Or do you find those people are, are simply in a situation where um, the gun isn't the right tool, they need to find some other way to protect themselves and those that they love? I think one of the things that, that happens when we start uh, talking to these people uh, is there are usually there are usually some perhaps emotional reasons that they want the gun, and this becomes sometimes a very difficult discussion because you have to dive into exactly why there's you know why these uh, why these uh, misconceptions are in their mind, and I found that sometimes it's the result of uh, and I hate to use this term but a lack of self-worth. They don't feel that their own life is worth protecting. And in those cases, I'll say, would you do that to protect your children? Well, of course I do that to protect my children. But I won't do that to protect myself. Well, why? And then we have the discussion, well, if you don't protect yourself, who's going to take care of your children when the bad guy kills you? And so, yeah, we have that discussion uh, quite a bit, actually. You know, Grant, that is the exact same tie that I use to try and help people to understand whether I'm trying to help them understand why it is that they might want to have a firearm and be willing to use that or when I try to explain why it is that I have a firearm you know the fact of the matter is is that my children deserve to have me around to raise them they haven't done anything wrong they're innocent parties and therefore you know I have the worth for myself and for my family to uh, to use that firearm that's a, that's an excellent point so let's write Get right down to the brass tacks, then, Grant. Let's let's start to answer the question of why is it specifically that we want to have a firearm for self defense? We've been kind of hitting all around it, and we've alluded to some of the important points. But when someone asks you that question directly and they're serious about it, how is it that you approach it with your students and those that are interested in personal security? Oh gosh, the why do we need a firearm for self defense? If that's the basic question, I explain it to them this way: the the person who's coming to attack you may be larger than you are. He may be more skilled than you are. He may be more dedicated to your demise than you are. And the firearm is the one tool that gives you an, uh, the ability to protect yourself against that extreme amount of force. That's the important thing to understand is that if, if we need to, to keep someone from hurting, from maiming or killing us, we need to be able to project an amount of force that stops them from doing that. Now, of course, when we talk about these sorts of instances, there are all kinds of, of uh, permutations that happen, but ultimately, when we get to the point that they can't be dissuaded, they can't be deterred, uh, you can't avoid the confrontation, the handgun gives us a very efficient, very compact, a relatively easily learned method to be able to stop a threat. And that's what we're talking about, is stopping a threat. There's, I, I can think of no other tool that one can carry, no other skill that one can have, that gives the petite 150-pound female an edge against a 225-pound ex-con who's been lifting weights for the last 10 years in prison. It's an efficient tool and that's why it's so valuable. It's kind of like, I, and I tell people it's like a fire extinguisher. I mean a fire extinguisher is useless except in a very specific instance but when you need that fire extinguisher there's very little outside of a fire truck with lots of firemen that is, is going to suffice in the same way with the with the lawfully owned or carried handgun. There's very little outside of a SWAT team coming down on top of you that's going to be as useful to you at that point in time as that firearm is. Yeah, both the fire uh, extinguisher example and, and one of my favorites, I, I love to compare firearms and automobiles. There are so many comparisons that work very well and the seat belt is one of those perfect examples. You know, the likelihood that I'm going to need a seatbelt today is actually pretty small. And it's a very small set of circumstances that a seatbelt is going to perform the way that I need it to perform to, to save my life, you know, only in a car, in an automobile accident. But the fact is, is that the consequences of not having that seatbelt are so high 
that every time I get into the car, every time I shift into drive, I make sure I have that seatbelt on so that I make sure I don't have to face those consequences. I make sure that I have something that's going to help me to avoid those severe negative consequences. And that's really the concept that I use to try and convey that to my students. I carry a firearm, not because I expect to use it, not because I want to use it, not because I may even need to ever use it in my life, but I carry that firearm because if the circumstances arise, the consequences are so great that I won't pass up the opportunity to have that equalizer, as you mentioned, to, to bring me to a fair playing field against that attacker. Exactly. It, the, the firearm is no doubt the best tool that we've yet devised that actually works. Now, you know, in the future we may, who knows, we may have something like, uh, we, we thought, for instance, the taser was going to be an incredibly useful, right. very valuable tool that, that might even eliminate a lot of the need for, for firearm, uh, eliminate the need for lethal force, and we found out, of course, it didn't. We may in the future have a, a, a tool, a weapon, that doesn't project lethal force but still stops an attacker. That would be great. But for right now, the best tool we've got in terms of its efficiency and in terms of its effectiveness is the lawfully carried or owned firearm. Yeah, Grant, I, I think that that's a really important idea. But the fact of the matter is, is that firearm by itself isn't going to do it. There are other things that have to go along with that firearm to make sure that you're going to be able to use it as efficiently as possible. And of course, I'm, I'm starting to get to training. How do you help people understand that idea that, they, again, it's not having the gun. It's not owning the gun. It's not having made the decision to have a gun that makes you safe. It's, it's being able to use it, being able to use it well. How do you help people understand that? I, I, I tell them it's a lot like driving. And, you know, we get back to the car analogy. Right, right. It's a lot like driving. I mean, I certainly, I, I grew up on a farm. I'm a farm boy. And I was driving tractors when I was six years old. So I was used to driving things. And yet, uh, despite that ability to drive tractors and all that sort of thing, I, I was not qualified to drive a car on the road carrying people. I needed training to be able to do that. And so I went through driver's education, learned all the stuff that I didn't learn driving a tractor, uh, even driving a tractor down the road, you know, towing farm equipment. And I learned the things that I needed to learn. One can certainly operate a handgun without training. I mean, lots of people do. It's a, and this is why I alluded to earlier that it's a device that needs relatively little training. I mean relatively little compared to, say, a martial art, which requires right. a whole lot of training. Anybody can operate the handgun. But operating it both efficiently and responsibly requires training. You have to know what to do. You have to know how to do it and why to do it and when to do it. And that's where training comes in. It's very important to learn how to do that, how to do it properly, how to hit your target so that you're not endangering people. Hey Grant, I don't know if you can hear me, uh, but uh, I'm having trouble hearing you. So I'm going to go ahead and keep rocking and rolling here. Course. It's a course that's powered by the Combat Focus Shooting Program. It's a street-proven program that uh, really delivers what I believe are the critical skills you need to defend yourself with a handgun. So that'll be April 5th and 6th. That's a two-day event. Uh, we've got coming up after that uh, an Ohio Concealed Carry, Fundamentals of Concealed Carry in Ohio, CCW course. That'll be April 19th. That will, number one, teach you some of those fundamental critical defensive skills and qualify you for that Ohio concealed carry permit. So if you're interested in that, check it out on the website. And, of course, uh, Grant, I, oh, it looks like I've got you back. Grant, can you hear me now? Yeah, you disappeared for a little while. Yeah, I, I had you frozen on my screen, so I've kind of gone into some discussion about the training events that we have coming up. And you came back just at the right time, Grant, because I was getting ready to talk about our event coming up July 12th and 13th for the uh, revolver, excuse me, defensive revolver fundamentals course that you're coming into town to teach. Why don't you tell us 
a little bit about that course and uh, what folks can expect. Yeah, we're coming in to teach about a two-day defensive revolver fundamentals class, and this it parallels a book that I wrote by the same title, Defensive Revolver Fundamentals, where I lay out the not uh, the the use of the revolver to defend yourself or your loved ones, and we talk about physical manipulation of the revolver, how to actually use it. You know, we've lost a lot of revolver knowledge over the years as police departments have switched en masse to autoloaders. So getting back to operating a revolver efficiently and uh, and effectively is a skill that, that takes a little bit of time to develop and it's a little hard to find these days because people just don't uh, use revolvers as much as they used to and there's not a real body of knowledge. So we talk about how to use the revolver efficiently, how to how to load it, how to unload it, how to reload it. We talk about mastering trigger control, that kind of thing, which is always a very, very important part of shooting a revolver. And then we delve into how to use the revolver to defend yourself efficiently against a lethal attack. So we talk about all of the, the concepts behind that, the idea of dealing with with counter ambush shooting, and we talk about the body's natural reactions and how they affect how you manipulate the revolver and all that sort of thing. It's a great class. It's probably I'm I'm going to be immodest and say that it is the well, best there's no class. Actually, going to be taking that course as a student. I mentioned the uh, critical defense of handguns, Matt Devi. Other. Um, I talked about the fundamentals of concealed carry in Ohio CCW. I'll be an instructor in that course. Occasionally to defend myself. Uh, we also have six, seventh, and eighth. The uh, Active Safety Conference is a four-day conference. We're going to have lots of instructors, and we're going to deal with everything from, you know, bad breath range, personal interaction, the entanglement, all the way out to a thousand yards. Uh, we've got all kinds of courses that fit in between, whether they're unarmed combatives, sharp weapons, handgun, carbine, and long-range rifles. So that's a pretty exciting time as well. So we've got lots of things to look forward to when it comes to. Uh, defensive training at Safety Solutions Academy in the Northeast Ohio area. And we're also going to be traveling around the country throughout the summertime uh, running classes as well. If you're interested in finding more out about those classes, you can head to safetysolutionsacademy.com. And if you just take a look at courses, you'll see some of the things that are coming up, uh, whether it's handgun, rifle, shotgun, carbine, we've got you covered. So check those things out. Grant, where can folks find out more about you? They can find out about my classes and, and the things I teach at www.personalsecurity.us. Outstanding, Grant. Uh, well, yeah, we've had a little bit of technical difficulties, and I apologize for that. We're doing the best we can. I literally had no Internet connection two minutes before we went live tonight. So hopefully the recording, uh, the bandwidth was enough to get us through. I know that we lost Grant a couple of times there. Grant, is there anything else that you wanted to throw in? I know you got cut off. Um, Anything you want to add in there on, on the fundamentals of defensive revolver, excuse me, defensive revolver fundamentals course? Sorry, I'm, uh, I'm fumbling around trying to operate uh, the computer and everything else. Anything else you want to throw in there, Grant? I think, I think we got it all in. It's going to be a great class, and I'll just tell people that it's probably the best class on using a revolver to defend yourself that exists in the United States today. And I'm, I'm being immodest, I admit it. Well, but but plain and simple, uh, you know, Grant. When it comes to training, I have um, an incredibly good uh, sniffer for the BS that's out there, and I've taken some other revolver courses, and and I've actually recently been asked to leave a revolver course. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that I'm bringing you into town for a reason. And, and I mentioned when you got cut off that I'm going to be a student in the class very specifically because you are a revolver expert. You're a defensive firearms expert, and your niche happens to be revolvers, although you deal very well with other aspects of the defensive world as well. I, I see no reason why I shouldn't be learning from the absolute best. And so that's why I'll be taking the course. And again, if you head to Safety Solutions Academy, right up at the top of the page, um, if you hit uh, on courses, you'll see that uh, Defensive Revolver Fundamentals is right there. You can get yourself signed up today. Grant, I really want to say thanks so much for taking the time to be with us today. And again, I apologize for the uh, inconvenience of the, uh, the connection there. 
And uh, folks should definitely head to personalsecurity.us and check out what it is that you've got going on. And Grant, I hope to talk to you again soon. We'll look forward to it, Paul. Thanks for having me. No problem at all, Grant. Folks, um, as I end my podcast each time, I basically will say to you, uh, head on out there, get yourself some training. Even if it's not with Grant or myself, when you do get that training, make sure you keep it simple. Please stay safe. And as always, have a great day.